So, Lord, we pray for the pastor as he shares your word. And, Father, for any of you that are not here today because of sickness, we think of Calvin. Dear brother, from way back, Lord, we just pray you be with him. And, uh, Father, we just pray that you give strength for each day. So, now we ask your blessing on this uh, service this morning for our singing. May it bring praise and honor and glory to you as we rejoice in all that you are to us. Amen. Just look to the, uh, the announcements. Um, just a reminder that on uh, this Wednesday, uh, instead of being at 7 o'clock, no, it's next Wednesday. That's right. There, this Wednesday is. Um, Youth Bible study at 7 o'clock, but then the following uh, Wednesday it will be after the time change. So that's, that's something else you need to remember that uh, on the, I think it's on the 3rd of uh, November, it's at 6 o'clock. I'm going to uh, call that for half an hour. So on uh, November the 6th, then the Bible study will be at 6 o'clock instead of 7 o'clock. Okay? Um, the YYFC Youth Journey for Christ meeting will be on October the 25th at 6.30 in Cedar Hall. BC Priests are being called for more information. Uh, Let's raise continuing the Bible study on God the Father um, next uh, Saturday, October 26th at 10 o'clock in Cedar Hall. All are welcome. Uh, next uh, Ladies Bible study will be on Saturday, November the 2nd. 10 a.m. in Peter Hall, all ladies welcome. Next deacons meeting will be held on Saturday, November 16th at 10 a.m. Not all are welcome, just the deacons. Um, some of you didn't catch that. Yeah. Uh, we're still looking for volunteers for the upcoming uh, Christmas concert in the Inverness Education Street. Uh, Trees are called. And our next annual Shamani uh, Baptist budget meeting will be held on Saturday, November the 30th at 10 a.m. Please circle out on your calendar. It's an important meeting for, for members. And uh, you don't have to be a member to attend, but you need to be a member to, you know, to vote if there's a vote. Um, but all are welcome to come. But it's important that the members uh, be there so that we can have a, a forum. Okay? And 
uh, remember that today, after the service, as, as usual, we have uh, a prayer meeting in your home. All the while. <laughs> Before we begin our singing, I'm just going to read uh, a few verses from Psalm 92. <coughs> It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. And I didn't hear one amen. <laughs> to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. Upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the harp with a solemn sound. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy word. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. Amen. Amen. So we're going to begin um, with one of my favorites. <coughs> I will sing of my Redeemer. <coughs> when we stand, And it's important this morning as we as we, uh, as we sing these songs. There's so much truth in all these, these songs that I've chosen, and it's really important that as we sing, uh, that we sing from the heart. Uh, anyone can sing with the lips, but the Lord is not pleased when we just sing when we just give Him lip service. But He looks on the heart, and so it's really important that we sing. With, with, with peace from our hearts to give glory and glory. Amen? Amen. Amen.
am thine, O Lord. Number 315. <laughs>
especially the hearts of the children and their minds, Lord, to, to hear your word, to understand your word, and Lord, to, to have a, a heart that grows towards you, that has a longing to know you and a longing to serve you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's my brother Roger, if you would come and uh, lead us in coming to the <coughs>
Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. As you know, last week we uh, ended our series on the life of uh, Gideon and what a tragic life that he had. And uh, today we're going to start a, a new series, which I call The Upper Room. And uh, we know that the, the Upper Room event was in John uh, 13 through John 17. Now, it is said that uh, Jesus gave uh, three main discourses, three main sermons. The first one is called the Sermon on the Mount, and we find this in Matthew 5 to 7. The second sermon of importance is the Sermon Concerning the End Times, which we find in Matthew 24 and 25. And third is the Sermon in the Upper Room, which is the last night before he died, and we see this in John 13 to 17. Now, the first states, the Sermon on the Mount talks about the, the kingdom of God and kingdom living. The Sermon of the End Times presents the entering of the kingdom and also the final warning concerning that everybody needs to repent because there is a judgment coming that Christ is the Messiah. And the third sermon, the one that we will be looking at, is the one in the upper room. And this represents the very heart of Jesus, the King Himself. Now, in this series entitled The Upper Room, Jesus will reveal to His disciple His very being, the deepest wishes that He has for His disciples. In reality, it's the very core of Christianity. But Christianity, what a is all about what being a disciple of Jesus is all about. You could uh, also call this uh, series the Testament of Jesus. It may be one of the most important series that you will hear or need to hear because it's the heart of Jesus that will be revealed to us. Now the title of the sermon for today is called True Servanthood and we will be learning about the washing of the feet. And this is a life lesson for all who declare themselves to be true disciples of Jesus Christ. Now Jesus had spoken the following in Mark 10 verse 42 to 45, but it seems that the disciples just didn't grasp it. They didn't understand what Jesus was saying. Now this is what is written in Mark 10, 42 to 45. It's written that Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. I'll repeat it. Jesus said, Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. <clears throat> For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. And this brings us to the first item on your sheet of paper. It's written, Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. So write, serve, please. That was the aim of Jesus. One of the aims of Jesus was to come and to serve to the point of serving and giving his life over. So today we're going to learn a basic lesson of Christianity. It was so imperative for the disciples to understand this that on the very night before he died, he repeated this lesson and also gave himself as an example. Let's look at John 13 verse 1. And we're in John 13, John 13 verse 1. It's written, it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He showed them the full extent of his love. Now, it's impossible, totally impossible, to describe this opening scene without noticing the very foundation of the life of Jesus Christ and the extent that this foundation will bring him. It brought him to give his life. 
The foundation of the life of Jesus is dual, as we see in verse 1. His love for the Father on one side, and also the love for His disciples on the other side. Now, in His love for the Father, He knew that the time had come for Him to return to the Father, and so He had to carry out the divine plan, and He did. He went to the cross. On the other side, in his love for his disciple, his disciples, he was ready to give up his life for them. And he also did that. So what two greater lessons can we learn from Jesus in his last sermon than this? Love the Father. Apply the plan of the Father in your life. And love your brothers and sisters. And be ready to do what it takes for them. Now, in verse 1 is also written, he now showed them the full extent of his love. And this brings us to the second item on your sheet. Uh, Jesus manifested the full, right? Full, the full extent of his love. Now, for Jesus showing the full extent of his love, he was able to manifest this by his humble service, as we will see, towards the Father and towards those that the Father had given him. We will see later also that Jesus manifested the full extent of his love for his disciples, first of all, by taking the role of a bond servant. Jesus did not rule over them, he served them. Now, on the very night before his death, we will see that Jesus thought of the welfare of his disciples before himself. Jesus knows what's coming. He knows the cross. He knows the judgment of the Father. He knows that he will be abandoned by the Father. Why? Because he will carry our sins. And even though he knows that, he wants to serve his disciples. And what does that teach us? about the value of the brothers and the sisters that we have. If Jesus before dying thought of them first, should we not, while we live, think of our brothers and our sisters first also? Could we dare, could we dare live a life which centers not upon ourselves, but upon the welfare of others, even in the greatest of moments, as Christ did. Now in verse 2, we will see that there are two situations that are directly opposed to each other. It's written, the evening meal was in progress. It's a Passover meal. And the devil had already prompted Judas, <coughs> Iscariot actually, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. On one side, we see the celebrating of the Passover, the meal of remembrance of delivery from the slavery of Egypt, thanks to the purifying blood of the lamb that was placed on the, uh, the posts of the house. So on one side, we have the celebrating of the freedom that we find in the lamb. On the other side, what do we see? We see that the devil is working in the heart of Judas Iscariot. On one side, we see freedom through the blood of Christ. On the other side, we see slavery because of the devil. Now, in the midst of his final hours, we see these two forces working, one for Jesus, one against Jesus. In verse 3 it is written, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under His power, and that He had come from God and was returning to God, and this brings us to the third item on your sheets. Jesus already knew He was about to return, I should have written return to the Father, but Jesus knew He was about to return, and as I said, He knows all these things. And what bewilders me when I read this is that it's written that Jesus had all the power in the world. The Father had given him all the power in the world. Jesus also knows he's going back to the Father. And Jesus could have done anything. He has all the power in the world. What did he do 
<coughs> what did he voluntarily choose to do? He chose to humble himself before those who were his own disciples for the last three years. Now this is the heart, this is the working of our beloved Savior. Look at verse 4. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. Now I want you to notice that the meal had already begun. The celebrations had already begun. They were underway. And what did he do? He decided to do something that was totally out of the ordinary. There was something more important than food. Something more important than fellowship. Something more important than celebrating. For Jesus, brothers and sisters, serving. Serving had its place on top of the list, way above the enjoyment of the evening. As I said, even more important than food, more important than fellowship, even more important than their religious gathering, because they were having the Paschal meal. So he stops everything. I wonder what the disciples thought when suddenly Jesus stops. I here can see the heart, the very heart, the secret heart of Jesus, serving others, <clears throat> looking out for the betterment of his disciples. That was the thing that really counted, even on the night before he died. So Jesus took off his outer garment. The Jews dressed like us a bit, in the, in the sense that we have inner garments and we have outer garments. So Jesus took off his outer garment, he still had his inner garments. And what did he do? He wrapped himself with a cloth. He let go of what was his. He let go of what was his for what was not. He traded his garment for a simple sheet of cloth. I wonder if we see the importance as Jesus knew, to abandon ourselves, to be able to be equipped to serve the brothers and sisters. And we all need to understand that no one, no one can serve others if he does not, first of all, abandon his rights, as we sang this morning, at the cross. No one. Now in verse 5, it's written the following, after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him, which brings us to the fourth item on your hand is out. Jesus, right, washed. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Now normally, the washing of the feet in a household was led to the lowest of the lowest slaves. The meal had begun. None of the disciples' feet were washed. Have you ever thought why? Why were none of the disciples' feet washed? Simply because all of the disciples saw themselves as being more important or better than the others. No one wanted to humble himself to serve in this fashion. Washing the feet? Ugh, it's not for me. Let somebody else do it. Now some are willing to serve in the church, but most, like we see with the apostles, have their limits. Rarely have I ever seen somebody who is willing to do anything, anytime, anywhere for the service of the saints. Most disciples, and I include myself in that, we like to do what pleases us. Rarely what is needed, or rarely what is asked. So Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, and he took the dirt of the feet of his disciples unto himself, right on the towel that he wrapped himself with. Do you see that Jesus is not afraid? 
He's not afraid of the dirt of his disciples. And if Jesus is not afraid of their dirt, the dirt of their feet, <clears throat> should we not be like Jesus? Not being afraid of dirtying ourselves by serving the brothers and the sisters. Now there's someone, someone within the apostles who did not want Jesus to wash his feet. He saw Jesus as too precious, too honorable to do that. After all, Jesus is the master. And we see this in verse 6. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Simon just could not see Jesus washing his feet. But at the same time, Simon could not see himself washing the feet of the others either. So by doing so, Simon was placing himself at the same level as Jesus. Jesus, don't wash feet. You're too... I'm not going to wash feet. I'm too... You understand what I mean? I wonder if we realize that when we do not serve others, we also place ourselves as being higher than the other person. As being almost like Jesus, I'm exaggerating. Yeah. When we don't want to serve others, it's because why we do better than them. I'm not going to do that. Now in verse 7 to 11, Jesus explains to Simon that he had absolutely to be washed or else Jesus would have no part with him. So it's written, Jesus replied, you do not realize that what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash your feet, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. So please notice that when Simon Peter understood what Jesus was doing, when he understood the words of Jesus, then he said this in verse 9, as we read, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. So Simon not only understood, but he accepted, and he was willing so now, let the master wash his feet. Now, isn't this the response that we should also have in regards with Jesus? Once we understand what Jesus tells us, shouldn't we desire to act upon it? Once the washing of the feet was finished, this is what is written in verse 12. He, talking about Jesus, put on his clothes, and returned to his place. I want you to notice a few things. First of all, notice that in serving, even washing the feet, Jesus did not lose anything. In serving, Jesus did not lose anything. He took back his clothing, and he put them back on. He regained what he had set aside, Nothing was stolen from him. Putting on clothing to serve will not rob us of anything either. Quite the contrary. When we serve, people notice, people thank the Lord that him, him or her helped out. So it's not because that we serve that we lose something. Don't be shy. Don't be afraid. Jesus, it's written that he returned to his place. Jesus did not even lose his position at what I call the head of the table. Quite the contrary. His disciples were all ill at what they were seeing. Jesus washing my feet and so forth. 
Now, to make sure that the disciples really understood the meaning of what he had done, Jesus asked them a question. And we see this in verse 12. Very openly, Jesus says, do you understand what I've done for you? Do you understand what I've done for you after washing the feet? Now, this brings us to article or item number five. Do you understand, right understand, do you understand what I have done for you? Jesus doesn't take for granted that his disciples understands what he's doing. And he's right. Because I don't always understand what Christ wants of me when I read the word. And I believe this question could be asked of all of us today. Do you understand what I have done? Or what you have read? Or what you have heard me say? So Jesus goes on to explain very clearly why he had washed the disciples' feet. Before all things, he speaks of his authority. He places everything in its right place. In verse 13, he says, You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. And I believe Jesus needed to remind his disciple who he was in relationship with what he did. Jesus is not only their teacher, he says, I'm your Lord. He has full authority in telling them and in telling us what we are to do. And brothers and sisters, we have nothing to say. We have absolutely nothing to say. The Lord doesn't need our advice. He's the Lord. We were bought at a great price, Paul tells the Corinthians, and in the presence of love, Jesus. He therefore, after establishing, guys remember, I'm your Lord, he therefore goes on to show that what he asked was not only founded on his authority, telling us what to do, but on his practice. Look at verse 14. It's written, now that I, your Lord and your teacher, so he comes back to what he just said, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. So this was their commandment. This is our commandment. It's our instruction how to live as a disciple. We are to humble ourselves as Jesus humbled himself to what? To serve one another. Even if it's in difficult moments in our lives when we don't feel like it. Even if I get to do what others do not want to do, I should do it. I have also to set aside my own clothing. And I have to leave my place, whatever it is, at the table. Because serving is much more important than what I look like or what people think of me. Oh, I wash the, wa I wash the washrooms. What are people going to think of me? You're a good servant, amen? You understand? It doesn't matter what people think. We do what the Lord asks us to do. And He will glorify us in due time. So Jesus then attacks our thought pattern about serving. Look at verse 16. It's written, I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sends them? And this brings us to article number six, where it's written, we are not greater, right greater, we are not greater than our master. Jesus is saying to his disciples that no one is greater than me. And if I have washed the feet, you should also be able to wash the feet. And if we do not wash the feet because we don't think that we ought to do that, if we don't want to readily serve the brothers and sisters, it only manifests one thing. Either we think that we are better than they are, or we think that we're on the same level as Jesus. So which one is it? Which one is it when 
I don't want to serve others? Which one is it when you don't want to serve others? Which one is it when we have a limit of our serving? I'll do this, I'll do that, but I won't do that. Which one is it? You're better than others? I'm better than others. Or I think I'm just like Jesus. <laughs> so, if you want the hand of God, if you want the blessing of God, and I hope every one of us here has that desire in his heart, Jesus tells you what you need to do. And that's in verse 17, which is our last verse. Jesus says, now that you know these things, you know that I'm your teacher, you know that I'm your master, you have seen me wash the feet, you have heard me say that you have to wash each other's feet. Now that you know that, you will be blessed. Amen. You will be blessed. Whoa. It doesn't stop there, right? You will be blessed if you do them. It's conditional. You will receive the blessings of the Lord God if you are at the service of your brothers and your sisters. So please listen, because Jesus is telling us a spiritual secret of great importance. A life of blessing goes through a life of serving. I'll say it again. A life of blessing goes through a life of serving. This is the heart of Jesus for you today. If I have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. And we have arrived at item number seven, which reads, we are blessed, right? Blessed, we are blessed when we serve others. Let's end with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that your son has washed my feet. I must confess that sometimes I've been lacking in serving for the benefit of my brothers and sisters. I sometimes hesitate to stoop down and play the role of a bond servant. Father, I also hesitate to change clothing or to leave the position that I hold around the table. May I become as Christ. May your Holy Spirit break my will and desire when they are not as a, clay, a piece of clay in your hands. Father, this church is in need of servants, men and women who desire to serve without calculating the cost. We need men and women who are not ashamed or filled with pride. We need disciples who do not count their time and have made you their only treasure. May we all serve each other without any reservation. <coughs> Amen. Amen. I believe we have one more song.
that it is of grace. In the beautiful name of your Son, Amen. 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 Amen.